Well, to discuss all the goings on at the two sessions, I'm joined now by Arthur Dong, who is a professor at Georgetown University's McDonough School of Business. And we're also joined again by our correspondent, Wang Guan. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thanks. So, Arthur, let's start with the top economic priorities going into this year's two sessions. How does it compare with last year's priority? Well, certainly the priorities that were just stated in this uh, two-day conference uh, by Premier Li Keqiang will focus on, in a sense, supply-side stimulus, meaning a cut in taxes to both corporates as well as small businesses and uh, other sort of uh, active actions that will, in a sense, generate greater consumption on the part of China's uh, household sector. And Wang Guan, how have we seen these issues being addressed so far? Uh, I think that uh, people's livelihood is really at the center of all these uh, legislative proposals. You know, um, 17 uh, imported uh, foreign cancer drugs are made uh, import uh, free. And also, um, it has a lot to do with the, the bottom line of enterprises, so the, uh, the tax cut, the lowering of fees for them. So really, um, the Communist Party and the Chinese government wanted to send a message to the private sector that they're still the cornerstone of the Chinese economy. And it's interesting seeing more of this balance of, of the social and, and the economic. When people think of China, they're so focused on the economy and that headline number when it comes to growth, they, they don't usually think about the balance. Um, now as we do look at that annual growth target, lower for 2019 at between 6 and 6.5%, and what should we read into that in terms of what's happening in China's economy? Yeah, what China wishes to do moving forward is they understand that the easy money has already been made. Moving forward, it's going to be much more difficult to sustain that level of growth. And so what they're looking for is more sustainable growth, me meaning qualitative challenges, qualitative changes within the Chinese uh, sort of economic model that will lead to a more sustainable pattern of growth. And what do you think some people tend to get wrong when they just look at the headline number without really understanding the nuances of the economy? Well, many people have been debating the merit of using GDP as the sole uh, benchmark of measuring the success of a society, of the one economy. So if you look at where the Chinese president has been so far at the NPC, first of all, he chose Inner Mongolia as the first um, provincial group that he attended at the NPC, and he sent a very clear message that is um, the so-called ideological, the so-called um, uh, ecological civilization that is paying attention to the environment, cut, uh, cut carbon consumption when developing the economy, uh, shifting from burning coal to more clear energy such as natural gas. So there's a big emphasis on that, not just the numbers. This is a range. This is not the first time the Chinese government uses a range to set targets for the economy. In fact, they did that five years ago. Now, also in Premier Li's uh, work report, he described economic development in the past year as a complicated and challenging domestic and international environment, a kind rarely seen in many years. So what do you think have been the most significant international issues that China's looking at? I think the significant international issues is this growing uh, acknowledgement that the world is fundamentally changing. Certainly pre-2018, we saw a world where global trade was accepted and now, you know, certainly with the onslaught of the trade wars, a closing of marketplaces around the world, not only in the United States, but in the other countries as well. So I think there's an acknowledgement on the part of China's leadership that things are changing and that even post uh, the resolution of this trade debate, uh, there will be continuing challenges around the world as to this question of free and open trade. And, and what about you, Frank? Because you mentioned not just international, but domestic as well. What are the, the standout issues for you? Well, I want to pick up on where Arthur had just said, that is the U.S.-China relations in terms of trade. A very important piece of legislation is expected to be passed, that is the foreign investment law. And many critics say this is a expedient measure to address critics in the Trump administration. But if you examine more carefully, this piece of legislation was proposed and went on trial in 15 Chinese cities two years before Trump went to office. So there was this internal drive to reform. In fact, reform appeared 105 times in Premier Li Keqiang's work report, the most frequently cited word. Um, of course, there was uh, external pressure from the US, and China might have taken that into concern. But to reform, to be more foreign investment friendly, has been on the agenda of, the, of Beijing for years. And so then looking ahead, how has life changed for, for the average Chinese and, and what are their expectations now? I think uh, uh, for the average Chinese citizen, uh, they are a bit humbled as a result of going through this past year, realizing that there are certain vulnerabilities in their model as well as their growth patterns. 
that suggests that uh, you know the uh, high degree of reliance on exports as well as the high degree of reliance on investment infrastructure spending uh, fundamentally is not sustainable within the Chinese economy. Li Keqiang addressed this by uh, uh, find, you know, find, trying to find ways to rebalance the economy and also placing greater emphasis on not only social stability and jobs, but also maybe ha having a higher degree of reliance on the 1.3 billion people, potential massive consumer marketplace that exists within China's economy. And Guan, we know that last year marked 40 years of China's reform and opening up, and we saw more free trade zones. Uh, we saw less items on the negative list. Um, and as you mentioned, the foreign investment law. Um, talk about how these measures, the sort of impact they can have, especially the view for, for foreign investors. I think this uh, negative list is a big thing because previously China has an investment catalog. Uh, and now it is shifting to a, a negative list. Um, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Arthur, but as far as I'm understood, uh, that is China went from nothing is allowed until those allowed with the investment catalog to now all is allowed until some are disallowed, meaning China is willing to accept more sectors opening up to the foreign investment, financial services, internet, uh, also even in terms of uh, media partnerships. So that is a big deal and also uh, Chinese really want to have better lives in terms of more available births in hospitals, um, easier access to health care, and more tax rebates. And so, Arthur, uh, what do you think in terms of what we've seen, the measures that we've seen for China to continue to open up? How much more potential do you see there? I think there's enormous potential. I know personally of a number of companies, dozens of companies, as a matter of fact, that are waiting on the sidelines, ready to go into China. Uh, but they're not because of the uncertainty that has been imposed over the last 12 months. Once we get to a trade agreement, uh, many of those companies will sort of rethink and re-enter the Chinese marketplace. So I think uh, moving towards trade liberalization, making easier access into the Chinese economy, reducing the regulatory burdens uh, that have been imposed previously, uh, I think all of these are very positive signs that will encourage further not only U.S. investment but global investment into the Ch uh, Chinese marketplace. Well, our thanks to both of you gentlemen, Professor Arthur Dong of Georgetown University's McDonough School of Business and our very own Wang Guan.